In today's Archaeology Gastronomy, we're once again examining the diet of the Norsemen, or the Vikings. Last time, we saw that they had a wide variety of foods and ingredients to choose from. But many of you were wondering, what is the evidence for this? And that is the topic of today's video. What exactly is the archaeological evidence for the food and the preparation of food amongst the Vikings? Well, as with any archaeological investigation, we begin with written sources of information. In this case, the famous Viking sagas, poetry, laws and sayings, many of which were passed down through word of mouth for centuries before being written down in the early medieval period. Such evidence is often incidental to the plot. For example, in the Laxadela saga, there's mention of a fishing station to the west of Iceland. In chapter 14, it is mentioned that people gathered in great numbers on the Bjarneyar Islands for the purpose of fishing. Another saga mentions a farm in the settlement of Throtha. Here, the residents are driven out by ghosts, leaving behind their fire, depriving them of light and heated stones for cooking and comfort. In another saga, the character Guthmunder was served warmed milk, which had been heated by adding hot stones to the liquid. He complained that it wasn't hot enough. And in another saga, a Viking set a trap for any who might sneak into his room while he was sleeping. He arranged a cooking pot and its chain, such that the chain would crash into the pot when the door was opened, an alarm. In the Icelandic law book, the Grey Goose Laws, the standard dimensions of an iron cauldron are laid out. Surprisingly, the volume for a standard cauldron was set at 7.5 gallons, around 30 litres. Other sources, such as the Havamal, Sayings of the Wise, recommend how to eat, for example drinking, in moderation. These written sources are invaluable, but most of our evidence comes from physical remains, from archaeology. A key excavation in the Viking world was in Coppergate in York in the 1970s and 80s. Here, the water table and the depth of stratigraphy led to waterlogged and sealed archaeology, perfect for preserving evidence of food. Now, in the previous episode, we examined the range of foodstuffs available to the Vikings, so I'm not going to reel off a shopping list of everything that was found. Rather, today we are examining the different types of evidence and some of the things that they hinted at. A key piece of evidence, and probably most obvious, are large animal bones, either the results of butchery or the results of meals. Bones which have been burned are often bones which have been cooked. This routinely yielded evidence of animals such as red deer, cattle, lamb and mutton, the larger animals in the Viking diet. In addition to this were bones recovered through sieving of soil on the site, in particular the bones of fish, often missed when digging. This provided evidence of everything from herring and cod to sturgeon, the fish which yields caviar. In addition to bones, other evidence of marine foodstuffs included oyster shells, often called the crisps of the Viking world. Other evidence comes in the form of cooking or eating utensils. On Coppergate, Kuppergata, Cupmakers Street, these were often made on site out of wood, but they also contained very important evidence. Wood is easily shaped but it also easily soaks up that which goes into it. In other words, the residue of food could be detected on the vessels which were being recovered from the archaeological site. This led to evidence of butter, milk and eggs at Coppergate. In addition to this were other residues of cooking oils, including linseed and hemp seed oil, along with the residue of honey. Fire destroys but it also preserves, and in the ashes of fires found on the site, in addition to the technique of flotation for checking the waterlogged soil samples, seeds were found. Sometimes these seeds had been charred, preserved in the fire. Other times they had sat in waterlogged soil, recovered by flotation, but they yielded evidence of everything from oats, wheat, rye and barley, to carrots, celery, peas and beans. 
even a very famous type of bean. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. In addition to fava beans, there was evidence of cabbage and spinach, and also berries ranging from slow berries to blackberries. I mentioned evidence of honey production because of residue left behind, but also there were the remains of bees and beekeeping. Of course, evidence of honey is evidence of a natural sweetener, but more importantly for the Vikings, it is evidence of honey wine or mead, or at the very least the capacity to make mead. Other evidence includes paraphernalia such as drinking horns. This is evidence of drinking happening on a site, along with, of course, cooking pots, spoons, ladles, and associated cooking implements. Not to mention the recovery of objects such as quern stones. This is, after all, how you get from wheat and barley to flour for making bread. Of course, York isn't the only place where evidence of Viking food has been recovered. Birka in Sweden is a great example. So too is Hedby in Denmark. Of course, there are other famous excavations, such as Oseberg in Norway, where they found not only food, but also evidence of a rather impressive ship. Jarlshof on the Shetland Isles is well worth a mention, one of my personal favourite sites actually, and of course Dublin in Ireland, where much like in York, archaeologists recovered the remains of a Viking street. Now, there is another form of archaeological evidence which we need to mention, and that is the inevitable. When you've eaten and had something to drink, almost certainly you're going to end up going to the toilet. That's where the Lloyds Bank turd, or coprolite, comes in. Discovered in 1972 beneath the site of what is now Lloyds Bank in York, this poo actually turned many heads, and arguably led to the Coppergate excavations. It was incredibly well preserved and contained evidence that its owner had had a diet which was rich in meat and also rich in bread. There wasn't much evidence for vegetables but there was plenty of evidence for these. This is a microscopic image of parasitic eggs. Yes, whoever owned the poo had a terrible case of intestinal worms. <laughs> As if that's not bad enough, the poo had one more thing to yield, one more gem, as it were, and that was that it contained a whole hazelnut. Whoever passed the poo had passed a whole hazelnut. Blimey. Oh, one more thing. It was found with some holly, probably mushed up with whatever the Viking was using for toilet roll. That would have hurt as well, I imagine. Anyway, hopefully this has opened your eyes to archaeological evidence for Viking food. Next time we'll be examining the diet of Vikings when they travelled. But now let's head over to the kitchen at 41 Feasts for today's recipe, and that is chicken stew with beer. Welcome back. Today's Viking recipe is chicken stew with dark beer. The ingredients we'll be using are chicken pieces. Our vegetables are onions, carrots and turnip or suede and we'll flavour the stew with some beer, some thyme, salt and pepper and the butter is to fry the chicken at the beginning. So first of all we're just literally heating up some butter in a pot. I'm not doing the traditional Viking thing of cooking in a pot over a fire but actually I'm just using my wok because I find that this is a good size for all these chicken pieces. So when your butter has melted or just about melted pop your chicken pieces in. I got my butcher just to joint a whole chicken for me. You can do the same joint it yourself at home or just buy pre-cut chicken pieces if you prefer breast or leg. So all we're really doing is just gently frying the chicken on both sides for a few minutes just to seal it. So gently turn the pieces over. I've added the vegetables, the onions, the turnip or swede, 
or you could use squash if you wanted to and the and the carrots now our carrots are orange in colour the Vikings wouldn't have had access to orange carrots theirs would have been white which I think would have made the dish quite bland in colour the orange brings a little cheeriness to it and now we're adding the beer and the seasoning I'm using a beer that's local to us this is a bit like a modern stew in a way where we would have added water rather than beer but the Vikings will have used beer as it was safer to drink than water so that was the beer and now some thyme salt and pepper and I'll just mix that all in together So it's been about 15 to 20 minutes and I'd say that that dish is ready to serve. Okay, so chicken stew in dark beer. Now this one is one I've been looking forward to, I have to say. So, so I'll try some of the meat first. Mmm, that's really nice. It's really, really moist, and, mm. um, and the flavours come through lovely, actually. <laughs> Not remotely dignified. Um, that's lovely. Oh. Mm. And then the broth. Mm. With the... It's basically vegetables mm. in beer, mm. and the butter flavour comes through nicely. Yeah, it really does actually. Really nice. And um, and they, again, this 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 is this is just. A nice meal. It's probably actually the nicest meal that we've cooked in this series, actually, I would say. Um, yes. Now, the Vikings would have eaten this with some of Mark's favourite, barley <laughs> bread. <laughs> Yay, the barley bread. Well, actually, it's an opportunity to dip the bread in something. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope it tastes a little bit better than okay, it so did the last time. Let's go. Now that is much better. Instantly, sorry, instantly better dipped in something. Do um, you want to try a bit dipped in something? Yes. Mm. It's warm, it's got the flavour. That's a nice dish of food actually, very nice. Um, so again, there we have it. A lovely, lovely meal cooked with the flavours of the era and um, just to give you a bit of a sense of that definitely do try this one at home. Mm -hmm. As ever, the recipe is just in the video information below. Check that out. Um, it, please do share your uh, results, actually, when you, when you do try this. And um, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments, don't hesitate to comment in the, video, in the comment section. Um, so there you go. Thanks again. Until next time, bye-bye. Goodbye.